further ado, I would like to invite Kathleen McCaffrey and Marcy Carsey. Hi. This is so cozy. It is so cozy. This is fantastic. Is this on? Hi. 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 Good morning. Oh, good. This is a good room. I'm Isn't like, it? yes, it's very sweet. We're going to have a, just a conversation with each other because I left my notes and questions, I think, in the Uber. So <laughs> we're going to just roll with this. Um, luckily, Marcy needs no introduction. She's an, if you're sitting where I sit, she's um, an icon and a legacy and everything you want to grow up to be. And so I think we could just make this a conversation about how you got here and sort of, I have a lot of questions for you. And um, I mean, you've done, I, I, I did do my research, like 2,000 episodes of television or something. Really? Just, yeah. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what they said on the internet, um, that you've done all that. But, and, and obviously shows that we all grew up watching Cosby Show, Roseanne, uh, 70s Show, Third Rock, all things. And so there's probably stuff to talk about about all of those. So we can just we can just jump in and I guess maybe talk about sort of the broad strokes journey of how you got here, how you got started, and how you got into this crazy industry to begin with. I guess like most people do, from nowhere, you gotta get somewhere. And so I was raised in a suburb of Boston. My dad worked in the Quincy shipyard, shipyard. And uh, I was mossy until I moved. <laughs> And, you know, I just, I, you find out what you love by the time you're in college or done with college. And so I loved English lit, writing, acting, and stuff like that. So I saw you did a McDonald's commercial. I did a lot of commercials on the side just to, yeah. I, cause I was broke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, after, I went to college at the University of New Hampshire, so I had never lived in a city. Somebody my from mom New went there too. I think my, it's my mom's alma mater also. Go Wildcats. Yeah. <laughs> so um, having never lived in a city, um, I went to New York, as you would. Um, but our dad, my brother and I, had, were given the greatest gift by our mom and dad. Our father said, you know, I will find the money to put you both through college. That's not your job. That's my job. The day you graduate, you're on your own financially for the rest of your life. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but it was so clear. You know, it was just so damn clear. And, you know, we said, thank you. Okay, got it. And boy, that's a motivator. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so when I got to New York, I, I took a temp job in the garment district ordering velvet. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but it was money. And um, every lunch hour, I went and bothered the guy who hired tour guides at NBC. Because I loved television so much growing up. I was, I was obsessed with television. I mean, television was introduced when I was a kid. I mean, we didn't have it before I was 10 or something. And it was just the most amazing thing ever. So when I saw that NBC, you know, that 30 Rock, that wonderful deco sign out front, oh my God, I said, there are jobs in here. There's an industry in television. I gotta, I gotta get me some of that. <laughs> so so I, I finally landed a job as a tour guide after I just bothered the hell out of this guy. And he, had, he said, okay, fine, get in the locker room, just get out of here. <laughs> so, and then from there I got a job as a schlepper on The Tonight Show, which was right upstairs. That's amazing though. Oh, it was such, oh my, oh my God, what a heady experience. 21 years old in the production office of The Tonight Show. Sounds like I mean, fun. Paul Newman walking in. Oh my know. God. <sighs> <laughs> Anyway, I, I was like, huh. <laughs> I once got so, I don't know, kerfuffled that, that I, you know, I was in those secretarial chairs that roll and go back and forth and stuff, and I wasn't used to that. And so I, I was leading to look at somebody, and I literally oh, went no. over backwards, oh. did a backward somersault, and landed at the, at the feet of the assistant to the producer, and she just went, Marcy. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> anyway, so th from there, then you just wend your way. You know, you, you know, you leave that. I got a schlepper job in advertising because you couldn't get promoted. You know, girl in 1966, you couldn't get promoted there to anything significant. So I took a left turn and got into prog the pr programming department of, of an ad agency in New York. And then you just 
get to where you want to go. Right. Well, then from there, though, you went to ABC, and I love this story about. Well, not from there, but several oh, jobs later. Several jobs later, you went to. Um, ABC, I, I wanted to work at a network because uh -huh. at the time it was the hub of the television industry. I mean, I thought, oh my god, and I was. I knew I was good at developing shows. I knew I was good at concept and casting and script mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. So I knew that. Oh yeah, you'd been a reader. We talked about that. I had been yeah, yeah a story yeah. analyst or whatever, right, and right. Um, so. So I wanted a job at ABC because, you know, CBS and NBC were not hiring uh, women, really. You, you just couldn't walk in. So I went to, uh, I got a job at ABC after, you know, having some friends of mine who were producing lobby for me. You know, there's this <laughs> really creative girl who, you know, in that little production company doing some really good work. So I got an interview and I got a job offer finally at ABC. So in and the talk comedy about department. that because one of the things I've loved about what I've learned from you is uh, what your experience with Michael Eisner was as a boss. Oh my God, Michael Eisner hired me. He was the he was a mid level ABC executive at the time, head of West Coast programming or something like that. So he was to be my boss's boss. So he had the final interview before I could get hired. So I had to tell him I was pregnant because you couldn't tell I was three months pregnant, and you know. By that time, it was 1974, I guess. 1974, and so I said, Michael, um, I, something I have to tell you. And so I told him I was pregnant, and if he, he would be more comfortable. I have a job that I like, and maybe we could talk after the whatever. He said, you know, Jane and I are having a baby about the same time, so I'm coming back to work. Are you coming back to work? I said, yeah. He said, well, why are we talking about this? 1974. I know, right? I know, I love that story. Crazy. Um, and I want to talk to you, we'll take a moment now, I want to keep going obviously into uh, Carsey Warner, but um, for I, just because it's specific to me, I'm going to ask a selfish question. I want to talk about your time as a development executive and what that meant for you and sort of how you knew what to buy and what you wanted, how much you wanted to buy and how you chose your talent. Talk a little bit about your time at ABC. It was, it was so great. As I said, Michael was a great boss and what he said to me you need a great boss. You just need a great boss because it's very hard. You're going uphill if you don't have somebody who understands what you need to do, what the core of your job is. So he said, I know what the core of your job is. Your job, at the time I was head of comedy, your job is to get one or two comedy hits that we will be proud of every year. I don't care if you do 50 horrible pilots, if two of them... Numbers 51 and 52 are fantastic. I'm never going to say, what'd you do that for? I'm never. He said, just swing from the trees, shoot for the stars, you know, and, and do noble failures. But don't do ordinary hit, ordinary successes or ordinary failures. Just go for it. And I, I mean, yes, you, noble failures, but we also talked about risk as an idea. And so what, at you know, sort of in your job, what are the things that felt most risky? Who are the talent you were most excited about? Was it sort of, were you most excited about the risks, would you say? Well, I think any hit show is a risk. Any, anything that you think can be a hit can also be a huge miss. Because right. generally hits, listen, I'm a dinosaur now. I haven't worked, I'm not working in television. So everything I say applies from <laughs> back But then. no, I think it also applies now. Okay. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, don't worry, no, we're in. <laughs> so um, the first show that I got permission from Michael Eisner to go to pilot on was Soap. You guys remember Soap? Yeah. Talk about risk. <laughs> but ABC management was game for it. Leonard Goldenson, who founded ABC, was still there all the time. He was sitting in every pilot screening, you know, when we would go to New York for the upfronts and for the whatever, but for the pilot screening before that, um, Leonard was in the room, um, always. So when I screened Soap, I had to introduce the comedy pilots, I had a tummy ache to beat the band. <laughs> I was just, and I explained a little bit, and I, and I said, this, this would be a risk if we put it on, but I really think we need to put it on, because it's, it's, it's great. And so, I showed the pilot, silence after the pilot, just silence in the room. Nobody wanted to commit themselves one way or the other. Leonard said, 
wow, we gotta put this on. And then everybody said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, great, risk yeah. is inherent in, yes. you know, if you wanna do and, some. Right, of course. And so then in that, I guess, talk about how you decided to leave and sort of start this company with Tom. How did you start about, talk about the origin of that, how you met him and how you decided to leave and, and take that risk. Um, well, I hired Tommy in 1976, I guess, at uh, ABC. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, you know, went up the ranks together, worked together. I, you know, it was, it, you know, we were a great team, tag team kind of, you know, thing. And so I left ABC in 19, the end of 1980 just because the management had changed and all the good guys had left. And mm -hmm. by the way, in the mid 70s, those good guys hired so many women to run almost every creative department huh. at ABC, at the network at that time. Huh. I mean, women running almost everything. And then, of course, that <laughs> turned around. Um, Interesting. Yeah. But so I hired Tommy, and then we worked together. So we got to know each other and how we worked, how we could trade off and everything. And so when I left ABC, I had a blind series commitment. I had done a good job in series television at ABC. Um, so I had a blind series. I had a whatever. and. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said to him, look, come with me, and I'll just split everything 50-50. We'll just do a 50-50 partnership. Awesome. And so he said, I gotta, I gotta find out what it's like to be like the boss first. So he spent a year, 11 months at ABC, and he said, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I, you know, I wanted to be independent, and so he went along with that, you know, because um, you get, when you, at the time, when you leave a network with a blind series commitment, studios want to make a deal with you because they want a cut of that. And they give you these huge offers, a yeah. lot of money. Here's your s dedicated stage. Here's your office suites. Yeah. And here's your da-da-da. And we'll just take a you know, yeah. piece of the profit. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, thank you. Right. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And so we, Tommy and I, had an office over a shoe store on Westwood Boulevard. Oh, my God. Because, <laughs> oh. you know, he has some resources, you know, from his family. Mm -hmm. I did not. Right. And so I couldn't get my dry cleaning out for right. a long time, right. you know. Right. And, but, you know, so we struggled. We did some pilots that did not work. Mm -hmm. And then we did, you know, he joined me in 1981, and we did the Cosby Show in 1984. Mm -hmm. So it took three years to mm -hmm. get stuff going. Well, let's talk about, so, so there was an interesting story you told me yesterday, and this is jumping ahead a little in time, but about Third Rock and ownership. And I want to talk, you know, sort of how you, yeah. you, you set up your shows and kind of the idea about owning your show and move, being able to move it around and tell the story you told me yesterday about, about what happened with Third Rock. Okay. I thought it was important to own the copyright of these shows, and so I didn't mind kind of struggling. I had two little kids, mm -hmm. both of which I gave birth to while I was at ABC, but, mm -hmm. um, but I, we were talking about risk. Mm -hmm. I have an appetite for risk, I guess. So I'd rather, you know, risk it, because I grew up without much money, and that was fun. I mean, I had a great time, mm -hmm. great childhood, mm -hmm. with no money, mm -hmm. didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I can do that again. Mm -hmm. Why not Why not risk? Why not mm -hmm. bet on ourselves? And so, and Tommy went along with it, although it's not his, Got in it. his nature to be a risk taker, but, but he there's said- there's trust in there too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So he said, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I thought it was important to be independent. And so we were as independent as we could be. We made a little deal with Viacom for a while. And then we bought back, you know, whatever percentage they had mm -hmm. when we could. Mm -hmm. um, so the Third Rock from the Sun story was we did a pilot on Third Rock um, for ABC. And they, you know, Teddy Harbert was at ABC at the time. And he, he was a nice guy and a friend of mine. And I said, Teddy, level with me. Is this going to make the schedule? And he said... Probably not, you know. It's like our fifth favorite comedy pilot, and we only have four slots. It's just so odd. Mm -hmm. And and I said, well, thank you. <laughs> and so I talked to Tommy and to Bonnie and Terry Turner, who um, created it and ran it, about maybe trying to get it out of ABC and sell it to another network. And back then, and maybe now, I don't know, networks had a six-month hold. When you did a pilot, they they... They had a six-month hold on it. So it, they could either schedule it for that season or the next season or the mid-season, or it would die. So they couldn't be embarrassed by somebody else picking it up and making it a hit. Because by the time six months goes by, eh, who cares, right? It's an old, dusty pilot. Mm -hmm. so, so I called Teddy and 
five other people at ABC Management separately. And I spoke slowly. <laughs> so they would understand. <clears throat> and I asked them, I knew them all, I used to work there, and, and I said, hey, um, would you consider releasing that six month hold on Third Rock from the Sun? I understand that it doesn't fit you know, your needs, but it, I would love the chance to sell it somewhere else. For the sake of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> She said. <laughs> In other words, my next hit is going to be on CBS if you, if you don't do this. I mean, I didn't say that, but, you know, for the sake of the relationship. <laughs> I love it. So um, they, they, they said, we'll get back to you. They huddled, and I found out later the discussion was this. Well, her only market, really, other than us, is, is NBC. I could see an NBC liking this. So let's release it to her the day after NBC sets their schedule. So they called me, they told me that, and I said, thank you, I really appreciate that. The day after NBC set their schedule, they picked us up for mid-season. Amazing, <laughs> amazing, right? Like, so smart, really smart. Um, okay, so we should talk about some other shows you did at Carsey Warner. My therapist tells me to just ask the hard questions. <laughs> so is there anything you wanna say about Roseanne? I wanna talk to your therapist. I <laughs> She usually says lead with them, but here we just eased into it, right? No, right, listen, I, 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 I am very proud of the show that we did originally, and the show that they, I, I, I didn't work on this one because I'm not working in television, but I thought the show, the reboot was terrific. Um, great job, great work. Um, so all I can say is, because I'm, I'm as distant from it as you guys are, it's a shame. I mean, a couple of hundred people doing really wonderful work, crew, cast, writers, you know, um, from the original. Huh? From the original. Yeah, too. a lot of the, the writers, crew, whatever, um, worked on the original. So, you know, to, to have that work so well and be so creatively interesting and to have it just disappear like that when everybody thought they had a, they had a gig, you know, the 200 people, 300 people. Had jobs. Yeah. So that's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. We did it. Got through it. <laughs> right? So now we can go on to easy questions like Bill Cosby. <laughs> Anything you want to say about that? And then I swear we're moving on. <laughs> you know, all I can say is, like, we were so proud. I am still so proud of that show, too. I thought that was a wonderful show. It was a life changer for so many people who have talked to us in the decades since. It just said, you know, I grew up with that show, and thank you so much. It really did change my, my life. Mm -hmm. And so that stands. I mean, that, the impact was what it was, and... Um, all I can say is life gives you these surprises. The Roseanne political stance, what a surprise. Bill Cosby, a man who, well, I just, all I can say is the guy that we worked with, the guy we knew him to be, or thought him to be, was a wonderful collaborator, a brilliant guy, very, very kind-hearted. I mean, when anybody had was sick, I had a loss or whatever. It was just, he was right there. And um, it's, a, it's a shocker, uh, I, you know. So, so to, you know, all these decades later to, you know, have these revelations mm -hmm. about, yeah. you know, it just, yep. it's, it's, yep. it's, it's awful. Uh, but yeah. it happens. Well, so now we can, we did. Now we can talk about some, talk about your experiences with these shows and sort of as, someone who is creatively involved, how you work with those creators, sort of what you think a creative relationship should be in, you know, when you're making a show, when you're developing a show, like talk about sort of the highlights for you in, you know, sort of in your life in terms of like who's a great collaborator and who are the people who you think, and how do you know? Like is it the magic that happens between you and and a talent, like a piece of talent? Like how do you? Are you talking about writers in particular? Writers, anyone, uh, throughout your, who are you when you, we were talking a little bit yesterday about like for me, um, every once in a while something comes along and you just feel like it's magic and you're just, you, there's someone sitting there and you're like, you are a talent and it might be risky, but I believe in you and I get excited every day to read your scripts to be part of this and talk about some of those experiences for you. Are there, are there any highlights that you would, you know, when, you, when you're looking back at the shows that you've done, which are obviously iconic, what are like the special moments for you in there? Well, um, I have a very narrow skill set the sets, you know, a, a range. So I, I'm really good at casting. I'm really good at talent. At, you know, I, 
and I'm really good at script, and and I guess concept because I am the audience. I mean, I just I think the best. I'm sure you do this. The best development people, the best programming people, are people who see this stuff from an audience's point of view. You know, I am the audience. I'm not programming for other people out there. I'm programming or producing for for me. And if I like it, there's got to be some other people who like it because I'm just a regular person born and raised in a regular way by regular people. And you know, <laughs> I kind of am part of that audience. So, um, but for some reason, I I I. I do know a star when I see one. And so it was a pleasure to build a show around Robin Williams when I was at ABC, um, uh, to build a show around Roseanne, yeah. Bill. Um, we didn't always do it that way. Third Rock was an ensemble, but Lithgow yeah. was so great, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, and then you said also in terms of, again, this is a slightly selfish question, in terms of when you're giving notes, you said something yesterday about how being a woman actually helped you in the notes process, which I found yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Kat was asking me, you know, well, we were talking about the, the good things and the bad things about being a woman, or have, in my case, having been a woman. Can you believe that came up? Weird. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I said, I think on balance it was an advantage, an advantage for me, because um, I know this sounds, I, I'm going to be kind of stupid about this, but <laughs> I could walk into a meeting with a writer, and I, I always thought of, writers as collaborators. I was whether I was a network person or, you know, a producer, it's it's a it's a discussion, it's a collaboration. Hey, what if we did what do you think? I mean, you know, we're just we're having a discussion about what might be a wonderful concept or show or piece of casting or whatever. And um what was I uh, when you when you were giving notes to a writer, you could walk into a room with a writer and, and Oh yeah. yeah. So being a woman um, it made me uniquely able to have a difficult meeting with maybe a difficult writer um, about a problem with the script and, you know, s s say, act two sucks. <laughs> and let's talk about how we maybe can, you know, let's, I'll suggest some stuff and see how you feel about it. To do that and then somehow just have a wonderful discussion about it, hug him, Goodbye, and th thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate your flexibility on this. And he walks out saying, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. was, that, was, that was pretty cool. So I don't know, something about yeah. how we deal with I think people. That's really I don't yeah. mean to generalize like that. Right. But I'll, right. I'll just say something about how I could deal with people as right. a woman maybe right. yep. helped. And then they, you know, something I do want to talk actually a lot about again for me is. Um, balance and doing all that work and sort of there is so much work and especially now uh, we were talking a little bit about how competitive the marketplace is now so for me it's my weekends are constantly reading I'm reading all the time I have so much homework and we were talking about how to be a creative person in the face of all the work you have to do you, you know I had two babies when I was at ABC nobody was having babies in 1974 and 1977 <laughs> nobody was having children the I the equal rights uh, amendment was in the air everybody thought oh it's that's gonna pass any minute now there was a wave, at least in television, or at least at ABC, there was a wave of hiring women. Women were all, all my friends were career people. Nobody was having a baby. So when I got pregnant, I, I, my friends would say, what have you done? <laughs> what? You have this great job at ABC, and what are you doing? So as a result, my kids got into college, because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that generation is yeah. small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, what I, Kat and I have talked about this, you know, a year or two ago. I hear from her, and I bet you guys could verify this, there, any balance between life and work has disappeared. Like, you know, employers today expect 24-7. What kind of creative work can you do about people and relationships if you don't have any. If you don't, if you're not celebrating relationships, if you're not celebrating your friends, your family, whatever, if you're not experiencing life in the broader sense, what are you bringing to the creative workplace? Right. So I'm astonished that any manager these days thinks it's a good idea right. to, to not have 
executives, yeah. creators, lead a full life. Yeah, I'm like CC, HBO management. <laughs> Um, and, and you're but it is true. It is true, and it's it's hard to it's hard, you know. Anyway, I'm I find it difficult to do just that when you're like you're so consumed with material. And and one of the things you said to me yesterday is like you never got bored and you never got exhausted. And that is something I find so fascinating. How do you do that for so long? And when you're you know it's a rat race. The these jobs, you're producing something and it's crazy and you're all in and it takes your energy and your time and hopefully your heart and all of that. And so how do you sort of you know sustain without getting exhausted? long careers. I was very frazzled uh -huh. when my kids were little. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was very frazzled because yeah. it's a lot. Right. But everybody knew when I worked at ABC, I would take my baby in whenever I could and close the door and nurse her and stuff. And green room of Barney Miller. I was assigned Barney Miller in my early days at ABC. I would like be, you know, people would come in and go, oh, mm -hmm. hi, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nursing my baby. But um, everybody knew I was going to go home at six. And that's it. Got to get home before they go to bed. You know? And mm -hmm. when I was a boss, when I had people working for me at ABC, I, used to, I would say to them very early on, when I hired them, I would say, you, you know, you're not going to impress me ever by staying late. You're not going to impress me, because I just think your priorities are screwed up. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're here after like 6 or 6.30, something's wrong. So I won't be here, but <laughs> if, you, if, if you think that that's, that's a sign of really being dedicated to your job, I think you can be really dedicated to your job and, and get out of here at a decent hour and go home. Mm -hmm. So, And I always did that, too. In fact, Tommy and I used to kind of argue about it because he thought it was productive to stay late and worry. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's not, turns out. <laughs> I was like, like, CC myself. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so... Here we are. What are you doing now? What's your day now? What are you passionate about right now? Now that you've left TV, what are you, you know, what are the things? I, this is the best, I, I hate to say this because I'm going to be dead soon, but this is the best no. period of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. My mother lived to be 105, so. Oh, my God. I know. Like <laughs> New England stock. Yeah, New England stock. Um, my kids said, oh, geez, mom, you're going to be the last man standing. <laughs> but, yeah, so I, um, when you, when you, are you guys, like, working in the industry, uh, most of you, or? Yeah? Um, some of you are maybe students, some of you look like kids, and some of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um. What's your day? When you, oh, yeah. wait, what's your day? What are you excited about? This is about? what happens when you're 73, huh? Uh, <laughs> pretty sure. So when you, when you, when you um, are done with your deep focus job, career, whatever, all these things spring up that you never could have predicted, you know? Like people sometimes are afraid of quitting their deep focus thing because, okay, who am I going to be then? Who am I going to be if I'm not this, you know, a producer or whatever? Um, but things just appear. So one of the things that appeared to me, I went to a University of New Hampshire, a pitiful alumni event in Los Angeles, because you know they couldn't find people. I mean, it's UNH. They have no money to go out there and find <laughs> alums. So there were like 10 people there. But it was, in the, it was held in the courtyard of the Hammer Museum, which is a wonderful small museum of contemporary art in Westwood. California. My mom was invited and was like, she's in New Jersey, and she was like, should I come out for this event? And I was like, yes, and then she didn't. But I'm, now I'm sad, because it was, if it was 10 people, we would have yeah. Oh, yeah. More, a little more fun. Yeah, but this was, yeah, this was like uh, years ago, 10 years ago. <clears throat> so it was in the courtyard of the Hammer, because Annie Philbin, who's the director of the Hammer Museum, is a UNH alum, and a relatively famous wow. one. Yeah. She told a story yeah. about, you know, she and her openly gay friends mm -hmm petitioned the chancellor for an alternate dance. And they were turned down because it was a state university and they needed the funding from the mm -hmm. conservative mm -hmm. legislature and stuff. And so reluctantly, they were turned down. Mm -hmm. The ACLU got wind of it, said, can we represent you? They went to court and won. So Annie Philbin <laughs> is celebrated every year at UNH Amazing. with a, with a pancake Amazing. breakfast. <laughs> She told that story that night, and I went up to her afterwards, and I said, okay, I want to be your girlfriend. <laughs> I, I, I am just, pancakes. I am just, I think you're just fantastic. 
So we became friends, and a couple of years later, she wanted me on her board at the museum, governing board, and I said, I, are you crazy? I am not a contemporary art enthusiast. She said, I know, but you're a progressive policy enthusiast, and that's what we're all about, <laughs> mm -hmm. our programming. Our mission statement talks about social justice, and I said, okay, you got me. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So anyway, now I'm chairman of the board, mm -hmm. and that is great fun. <laughs> I know, that is awesome. Great. So you, know, you find things to do, and there's lots of people to be helped and lots of ways to help people, and mm -hmm. I'm very involved in public education because mm -hmm. I'm a product of that, and I, if I, there hadn't been a public university, I don't know how I would have. I don't know how I would have. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. lots of stuff out there to be done. Great. Is there anything else you feel we've missed? I don't know how we're doing on time. Did I get a signal yet? How do we have? We've lost our time? Oh, we have lots of time. Yeah. What other stories do you want to tell? Oh, I don't know. Great. You want to get some food? We, I know, exactly. Pizza? Like, who's got the tequila open? OK. Um, OK, well, I guess we can talk more about, I would love to talk more about just your time at Carsey Warner and sort of some stories. And, and really, I guess for me, what I'd be curious about is, um, you know, just like in making the show, sort of some challenges or things that you've learned along the way that you would impart to, a, a, you know, some, someone like me. So I think, I think, you know, I said I have some skills, very narrow set, but I do have those skills. <clears throat> so apart from that, the, the best um, thing I have going for me is my love of, my tolerance for risk. And I think that applies no matter what you're doing in your life. I mean, just anything, personally as well as professionally. Risk. Nobody ever was on their deathbed bed saying, I, I shouldn't have taken the risks I did. Most people say I should have risked more. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're developing shows, mm -hmm. um, whether you're wondering whether to marry that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I love him. Right. But <laughs> something's wrong. But you love him. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Period. Um, but anyway, so risk taking, oh, should I have a child or two while I'm working at ABC? You know, stuff like that. Right. Right. Should I tell my management I'm going home now because I need to live a life? <laughs> <laughs> Risky. Um, I, uh, okay, so, so then are there, I guess, yeah, just what, what's something that you, sort of a hiccup that you went through that you can recall? They're like, in sort of navigating it, I guess really what I'm asking is, okay, I'll just be, whatever, talent can be difficult. Sometimes, it, right? So like sometimes it's just, and it feels like it's, it's, and especially now for me anyway, with like the, with like an iPhone, you're constantly dealing with it and sort of getting out of things gracefully is always something that I'm curious about and sort of how to be very honest and transparent with someone, but also to, as you were saying about the writer, be like, but I love you in the end. So any, you know, sort of advice about that I think is really useful because I think what, one of the things about this business is like how to say no well um, and, you know, you can't, you, you, like, sort of this, how, like, how to, how to how make a no feel good is a big, it's something I do have to do every day, and I find it really hard and exhausting, and how do you not take it personally when you know, for me, again, I'm sort of, people send their scripts into HBO, and if it's a no, you know you're breaking someone's heart, right? And that's kind of, like, it weighs on you. So anything about that in terms of, like, how to give a good no, is honesty really the best policy? What do you think? There's, it depends on, obviously, there's a thousand ways to say no, yeah. um, depending on the, you know, sometimes, often, mm -hmm. you're dealing with a writer, let's say, mm -hmm. or a writer-producer, mm -hmm. who you like and admire. It didn't work, whatever he or she is doing, mm -hmm. the, either the script um, needs a lot of work or it didn't work at all, or we're not going to pilot on it, or there's a pilot and we're not going to series on it. Mm -hmm. Those are tough. Yeah, really tough conversations. Um, but... You're working with this person because you really admire what they do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working with them. Right. And you wouldn't have ordered the script or right. you wouldn't have ordered the pilot. Right. So you just say, I, I, you know, we've got to do something else right away. Please, you know, don't, this is just what this network or what we as mm -hmm. producers think we can sell or right. what the network can put right. on. You know, I've right. worn those two hats. Um, it's, it's, but you as a talent is, so precious to, to me and to us. So so we've got to let's 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 get drinks tonight and talk about the next thing. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. Right. And then what's a no? Is there a no that you got that you sort of never got over? Huh. Who do you still want to fight? 
not going to go there. <laughs> They're still around. <laughs> Fair I, enough. Yeah, I, you know, it didn't happen often. Um, because, you know, we, we're the first ones to recognize usually when something's not working. When we think it's working and they don't, that doesn't happen often either. But when it does, you do something like yanking third rock out if right. you can. Right, right. Um, for it. Um, you know, I, I, again, I kind of, I think that personal relationships are what they are. If you're good at that, yeah. then you can say no. Yeah. You Who know? are some of your favorite relationships other than, you know, sort of... I think the best writer-producers we ever dealt with were Bonnie and Terry Turner, who wrote and produced and sh ran the show on um, Third Rock from the Sun and that 70s show. And, you know, the best thing about them, their training was at SNL. They, were for, they worked for years at SNL. They did the church lady. They did, you know, iconic things, you know. I wrote movies um, that, that Lauren produced. Mm -hmm. Um, so they know rejection. They knew how to take it well when somebody just threw their, you know, their sketch on the floor. Yeah, we can't do it this week. No, we don't. No, it won't fit. No. You know, it could be your favorite sketch. You could have been up all night writing it, and it's rejected in one nanosecond. They learned to go, okay, all right. <laughs> More where that came from. So by the time they got to us, they were the easiest people we ever worked with. Be not because they were pushovers, but because they, you know, they would hear what you're saying and go, oh, OK, well, what if we did this? I mean, they just, it was never about ego. It was never about defensiveness. They were just the most wonderful, and by the way, terrific writer producers. I mean, Third Rock and that 70s show. Yeah, amazing. Oh. Too shabby. Um, so to, I was just going to ask, so Based on that, one of the things um, my first boss in the business said to me very early on, he was like, never forget, it's not show friends, it's show business. So in those relationships, how personal did they get for you? Are there, how do you keep your as boundaries? As personal as I want them to be. Right. A so as how, we yeah. mutually want them to be. I mean, I was always best friends with Bonnie Turner, you know, from the minute right. I met her, I think. Right. You, know, mm -hmm. I mean, what, you know, it is what it is. And so it doesn't affect your ability to say no, in fact, it enhances it. Right. Because <laughs> right. they, they know the same side, you yeah. love them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but right. you can't do it for some reason or other, you know. Right. So I, I just, I think it's, I think uh, yeah, business, I, look, first of all, I think when you go to work, you bring who you are to work. Right. You know, it's, there's no dividing line. There's no difference between who you are at work and who you are at home or with your friends or whatever. In fact, you can't be a good manager, yeah. executive, producer, you can't be a good leader unless you have character, unless you, you know, you, you know, you can't. You can't be an insecure person. You can't be afraid of delegating because of that. You can't be a, you can't be snarky. You can't be, you can't, you know, your character is how you manage. It's how you work. It's who you are, you know. So, so I don't know, management coaches, I don't get it. How do you coach somebody to be a good person? Right, right. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Was that one of one of your favorite parts of the job? Was management? I love yeah. being around people, and I love. Yeah, I'm a good. Yeah, I think people yeah. like working. Yeah, people with me respond and well to good to good bosses, and I think building a team is part of it too, especially in this business where you are, especially in our meetings when we're working with writers, and it gets very personal. And when you dig into a script, usually the writers, at least who we're working with, are writing about something that's personal for them. So you have to give something of yourself too, which is why the lines do get blurred and blur, blurred rather, yeah. And also, kind of the bravery. I guess this goes back to yeah. the risk thing, but you know, you got to be willing to. You got to be. You got to be willing mm -hmm. to get fired every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yes. <laughs> Walk out of here like, hello, world. Um, yeah, I think that's Thank a good God point, Thank God I'm not though. selling yeah. to HBO anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let me in the building. No, we would. We definitely would. I think, no, I, you're right. You're right. And you forget that sometimes when you get bogged down, but you're like, you're right. You these things. You you're fighting your for job, the And you got to do job. your job mm -hmm. as you see fit. And, and it's, even if your boss or bosses think you're doing it, you should do it another way. You've got to say, well, no, I think I can be most effective if I do this, this, and this. Yeah. you got to be willing to be fired. And I was with two little kids at home. I was always right. willing at ABC to, right. be, to be fired. Yep. Um, and then, wow. yeah. Or in, in, as a producer, mm -hmm. I have to say, I was, a, I was a bit of an enforcer, you know, because mm -hmm. 
I was always willing to shut down a show at a moment's notice. Hmm. You know, if there was, you know, behavior going on that we, you know, whatever. I would just say, look, I, I'll shut this down. <laughs> yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta be nice. You gotta behave. So, well, here's a question too. So, oh, I'm really making this about me as a woman, and I didn't want to ask a woman question, but I'm gonna do it. Um, I mean, I do want to ask them, but like a specific, like as a woman, and here I just did it. Um, but there's something about fear and being a boss and being powerful, right? And I think there's another panel about this later. But, but how did you? How do you assert yourself? Like, there's almost some, there's something a little beneficial about people being a little scared that you might actually shut down the show. Like, how do you maintain that, but also kind of maintain these warm, wonderful relationships? Like, you kind of have to do both things. Yeah, that wasn't. Um, I only had to have that conversation a couple of times over okay. over all those years. That's good. Um, so. It, that was very unusual. Yeah, did you but, ever actually but do I it? But I think you have to have that in your, you have to have that yeah. mindset. It's really about the mindset, not about the actual, mm -hmm. you know. Executing it. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, if you, you have to say, yeah, th this, is, this is how it has to be. This is how people behave. This right. is how, this is how we're going to, right. you know. But people believed you when you said that, which is great. But sort of establishing that. Right. But, you know, you do your work, you, you mm -hmm. do your job, you do your job differently if you walk in with that attitude in your own head. Like, I'm gonna do the best job I can possibly do in the way I think it ought to be done, and if I get fired for that, okay, I'll find another job. I know that sounds like simplistic, but look, I had no resources, and I, you know, put that in my head. I know it sounds simplistic, so. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, because, you know, it's. it's I mean, people need to keep a roof over their head, and so right. did I. Right. Right. But somehow I just thought, oh, I can always get another job. And I'm the nice employable. thing too, you find about you, you can, it's, it's, yeah, you can get another job. Right. That's what I was going to say. It's like you bounce back some way. It you might be at the, the house job. of pancakes, but yeah. But, but it's another job. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hard work. It's hard work. Um, okay. I'm going to not be selfish for a few minutes and let other people ask questions. Yes. Is there a mic? Shout it. Oh. Hello. Hi. I'm a big fan of everything you've done. Um, <clears throat> I have sort of two short questions. Um, one is, in the early 80s, I, I researched sitcom history. I'm a huge sitcom fan, and there was like no, before the Cosby show in the early 80s, there was not really any sitcoms that were popular or not. in the top 10. Yeah. And you said you were not having success for three years also on your own. Did, did it ever cross your mind, like, are sitcoms dead, or you were just confident, no, they'll come back? And Great so question. my other quick question would be, did you ever want to do what Norman Lear is doing and come back at this stage of your life and <gasps> make it. something else? <laughs> <laughs> so the 80s thing and the Norman Lear thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not driven to come back. Okay. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> huh? Why? 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 Why are you not <clears throat> well, I did it. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it's different now. And I'm not sure I like how it's different now. We were independent. We risked everything every time we did a show. It was a lot of our own money going into that stuff. And, um, you know, we bet on ourselves a lot. I don't think you can do that now. I think the business has changed. And that model yeah. doesn't work anymore. So right. we would have to be, I would have to be, you know, a pod of some studio or some network or some whatever's out, Hulu, Netflix, all that stuff. I would have to be a, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I'm too feisty. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So, yeah, for whatever reasons, I'm just not driven to do that. Life is full of wonderful things. And now, you know, I can watch it and I don't have to produce it. <clears throat> But in, in the, the, the early 80s, one, did yeah. you ever fear sitcoms were dead? And <clears throat> OK, that's such a great question. No, um, because my feeling was always we should, you know, we would look at a, tel a network schedule um, and say, what's not on? You know, what is America thinking about and talking about, worried about? What's keeping them up that, when, that is not on television in a comedy somewhere? That's how Roseanne came about, because nobody was talking about the plight of the working woman without perks, no college education, no rich family, no um, super duper, a husband with a super duper job, none of that. Just take everything away, and 85% of the households in America, 
you know, the women were doing that. You know, eight hours at work, eight hours more at home. And it was, you know, nobody was talking about it. So that's how that show came about. So as far as the lack of comedy, and you're right, there were no comedies in the top 10 in the early 80s at all. A half hour comedy, everybody said, was dead. We had a bitch of a time selling the Cosby show. In fact, we had a bitch of a time selling everything we ever sold. It just, it's, it's always hard. They never look at you like, oh, you have that hit? I guess we'll buy whatever you're no, selling. Yeah, they go like, right. uh, I don't know. Always hard. <laughs> 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 you know. The Cosby Show. How did it get sold? Was um, NBC was in such bad shape at the time. I mean, it, it, they were not having um, good luck in their programming. Um, I think it was a filler. I think they just needed something. And then when they picked it up, I don't think they thought it was going to work. And by the way, they didn't like the concept because they thought, well, this is no concept at all. You know, how do we promote a you know? Rudy's goldfish dies. <laughs> it was really sad. When Where's that the happened? sizzle? <laughs> so, but we held fast. They wanted Bill to be a Las Vegas comedian, talk to the camera, you know, the George Burns model, and then go in and out of sitcom. We just said, no, it's got to be what it's got to be. This is a guy who has talked about the commonality of the human experience for his entire career, and that's what it has to be. And he has to be the first. This has to be the first African American family that is not dealing with on what African American families do on television. You know, being too poor, not enough money, not enough whatever. Um, um, this has got to be something else. This has got to be let's show people something else, right? That that hasn't been really shown before, and he was the guy to do it. And and because, well, anyway, um, so NBC finally said, you know, okay and put it on, it, they put it on opposite Magnum P.I., thinking it might be, it wow. might be a slow second to Magnum P.I., just, you know, if people want to laugh instead of, whatever, watching a cop. <laughs> but, so, yeah, they put it on thinking it was not going to work. And, and we, we uh, delayed sending them rough cuts. We were shooting in Brooklyn, and they were in L.A., and, you know, those days you had a FedEx a rough cut, a three-quarter inch tape rough cut back to them, and we would say, oh, didn't you get it? <laughs> Check the mailroom. You know, we did, didn't we send it? Yeah. And so they thought it was going to be a failure because we would over tape. I mean, for a 22 minute show, we would do a 45 or 50 minute wow. taping and let Bill ramble yeah. when he yeah. had to. Because between Jay Sandrich, who was the director of almost every episode mm -hmm. for three years, mm -hmm. the first three, mm -hmm. and Felicia Rashad, who knew exactly how to get bit. Bill back to where he needed to be so that they could cut. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Yeah, you know, she would if she had to, she'd just grab him by the sweater and just just say, and another thing, just to get him back on story yeah. and just to get so so <laughs> this ramp so Garth yeah. Ansier, who was our yeah. program exec uh, network executive mm -hmm. on the show, mm -hmm. would you know, come to Brooklyn and watch a taping and just go, Oh my god, that show is a disaster. <laughs> It's like 45 minutes long. It's like a disaster. <laughs> How are they ever gonna cut get a cut a cut a show out of that? And of course, snip, snip, and bam, you know. Yeah, you um, but we didn't, we delayed the rough cuts, because the other reason is, I, we wanted to own the copyright on that show. And if they had thought it was a hit, we were just on yes. the cusp of the FinCEN right. rules. Of, it, it was in the air that the FinCEN rules were gonna change, mm -hmm. so that networks, they didn't used to be able to own shows, but mm -hmm. it was in the air that they were gonna be able to. Mm -hmm. And so, we just wanted them to think it was a failure. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And then it wasn't. And it wasn't. Um, <laughs> yes, go ahead. I, you know, Kat should answer that. I have no idea. You know, I've been out of the business since 2005. <laughs> I love it. I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but since I imagine it's, it's way different, exhausting. right? It's, it's very different. Even since I've been at HBO 10 years, uh, like I've said yesterday, Netflix was only DVD, read DVDs then, like when I started HBO. And so now just so a pitch walks in. They're like, okay, 
thank you for hearing our pitch. We're going downstairs to Hulu. We're doing, going across the street to Amazon. We're going over to Apple after this. And they just there's there's so many more buyers, which I think is great news if you're a writer piece of talent. Like you will sell something somewhere. You will get your show. But now it's it is harder for us to be discerning and sort of you know be careful about. Um, making sure the good stuff really gets through and you're not being, you know, bogged down by just all the content. So, yes, Leslie. Oh, boy. Um, I'm, I'm curious, if you were, what, you, what would you have done if, not to bring up Roseanne again, but to bring up Roseanne again, <laughs> what would you have done if you were still a producer on the show right now? Do you think ABC made the right decision? I totally understand why they made that decision. So, because I was not in the room, I, was, I had nothing to do with that show, I, I, I honestly... But I'm comfortable with it. I mean, I, I understand. ABC, just as an observer, seems to be doing a great job diversifying its programming and its executive ranks. Yes. And That's so, awesome. And so to have that kind of, I, I just, I think it's just not what the network wanted to, you know, have represented. I would have a very difficult time. I, I think I would not. I think I would just say, okay, we had a wonderful run. We had it, you know, I love the show that we did all those years ago, and I think this reboot was great, and I would just move on. Yeah. Hello. Um, could you speak on, in a few words, if you could, why television is important? Um, then as somebody from behind the scenes, and right now you're just a television viewer, which I'm sure is super comfortable for you, um, <laughs> how the ways that you believe and know that television is important. I know to me, beyond just the storytelling, uh, the representation of life, even I understood branding at a younger age because I was so used to seeing Carsey Warner at the end of a show. <laughs> and I'm By like, the way, Sam, huh. really good point. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, oh, okay, I know that if I see this, this is probably going to be something that I like because I've seen so many shows with that behind it. What are different ways for you that television is important and like on the whole that television is important? Thank you, bye. <laughs> I just think what else reflects society and reflects our concerns more than television? What else, you know, comes into your home and talks about stuff that you're thinking about and talking about every day and like shows a different aspect of life, a different way of thinking, a different approach to the world? I don't know. I just think it, it's it's um, I think it's miraculous, um, and I and I think it, it's best when it leads rather than follows what is going on out there. Awesome. Does that? <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's great. We have time for one more. Oh, I'll do two more. If you guys go quickly, go ahead. Um, and I know you touched on it a little bit, but is it possible to separate? the art from the artist. I mean, there's a lot of, like you've had in with Woody Allen. It's just very hard. Mm. I just can't give up the appreciation for that, but then I, it's just that dichotomy of like, I don't like that person, but I can't give up my appreciation. So just more your thoughts on that. That's a tough one, isn't it? Uh, it's hard for me too. But then, you know, I kind of go back to like, I don't know, the old masters or, or you know, wonderful artists that we've, that are iconic from our history, some of them were not nice people at all. And do we look at those works of art, those iconic works of art, do we look at that and, and, and the first thing that comes into our head is, oh, that guy was mean, or he was nasty, or he killed, he divorces, whatever. You know, I don't think so. Um, so I, I guess my desire would be, my wish would be that the work can stand apart. I don't, as a person, it's hard for me to. So it's a tough question. I, I, I can't answer that any, any more than you can. Go ahead, one more. Um, you talked about risk taking, and I know you work primarily in broadcast, but I see a true lack of that now. And is there room for risk in broadcast when you're just struggling to find eyeballs when that risk is coming from cable? And what's a show that you would like to see, even though you're not on the ABC side of it now? Is there a I think it's even more important for broadcasters to take risks now. 
I mean, you know, this is not the time to be doing safe programming at all. When your competition is, oh my God, the stuff that's coming into our homes electronically is fantastic these days. So if you're not reaching for the stars, if you're not, you know, swinging from the trees, ah, you're just going to get lost. And you know, so, um, so yeah, I, I just, if I were working at a broadcast network right now, I would be taking more risks than ever um, with programming. Does that answer? There was another part to your question. Yes, tell me what show you need and I'm going to buy it. <laughs> Please say it now. No one tell. You know, honestly, I don't ask myself that anymore. I just am a viewer. <laughs> I don't need to. It does I don't feel need like I, would, I wouldn't ask that either. I'd be like, yeah, I'm no, done. No, you know, about that. I mean, look, give me five days but and I can it. answer that question. But I really am not, uh, I'm not, because I'm not in the industry, that would be the first thing. And the, and the primary thing that I ever did as a network person or as a producer was, okay, what's missing? What are we not talking about? You know, But I haven't asked myself that for a long time. Um, and there's so much programming out there now, I, don't even, I haven't even seen half of it. I mean, I don't even know how, how do you have time? My daughter and my son say, hey, mom, you gotta watch. What the f is that? <laughs> I, <laughs> I've never heard of that. Where do I find it? You know. But no, so I, I, can't, I can't answer the question. Damn it. <laughs> okay, would you have a question? One more and then we're out. Yes, Sorry. thank you for being here. Um, what are you watching? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Handmaid's Tale is scaring the bejesus out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so damn good. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I can only watch one episode at a time. You cannot binge on that show <laughs> without putting your head under a blanket afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, my kids and I are devotees of Game of Thrones. Yes. Um, <laughs> I love stuff that my kids like too, because it's oh we 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 loved um, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm on the Peabody board. We gave it a Peabody because it was just Amazing. so damn I mean, good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's another thing that I I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're busy. You keep yeah, busy. Yeah. All right. La I'm just gonna ask one final to, for leave us to for you to leave us with a final thought. Just what tell us, and it could be anything. What is one thing you know for sure? Love works. Oh. That's awesome. This is great. Can you, can you believe? I'm so lucky to be up here. This is amazing. And congratulations on your award. And thank you for all the television and just for being an inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you.